Um, so thank you very much for coming. We really are thrilled to be able to um, convene this, this session between SCI and, and GCP and have such a stellar panel that's going to contribute some reflections around what is clearly uh, a critical issue. We're at a juncture in all sorts of ways. We're in a juncture in terms of the fate of tropical forests. We're in a juncture in terms of levels of uh, aspiration and interest, let's say, uh, not even saying uh, commitments at this stage, um, of uh, responses to the challenges. And we're also at a juncture in the kinds of tools and approaches um, that are being deployed, that are being developed, that are being put on the table to try and seize the moment um, and, and turn this situation around. And one of them is a better understanding as to how supply chains work. Uh, information that can provide a more transparent view of the way in which actors across the world are connected to landscapes across the tropics and therefore hold uh, some kind of shared interest, uh, if not shared responsibility, uh, shared stake in the fate of these landscapes. And that's the starting point for potentially transformative change. Um, now, what we're focusing on in this session is looking at how can we harness the kinds of information that are being made available to track and monitor the performance, not only of companies that have been uh, more visible in making uh, big commitments to cut, eliminate deforestation from their supply chains, but increasingly governments and also other actors. So we're going to speak to some of the critical gaps uh, that exist in, in the information that's currently available. We're going to speak to some of the key kind of architectural features that need to be put in place in order for this system to work, because it's not enough that we have parallel systems that look on the one hand at how companies are performing in isolation of the jurisdictions and the territories uh, and the countries in which they're connected. Those two things are interdependent. The fate uh, of a landscape in, in Brazil or in Indonesia is determined in part by the changing, the shifting performance of the downstream actors and supply chain actors that are connected to that landscape. So it won't work for us to have parallel systems that uh, assess the performance and that motivate uh, these two uh, uh, hitherto quite parallel efforts uh, to connect to change on the ground. Because at the end of the day, it's change on the ground, of course, that needs to be, needs to be visible. And we're going to also speak to some of the profound risks uh, and uncertainties in how this system is deployed. If one monitoring and performance assist system is put in place before another, that brings certain implications. If we have a system of jurisdictional uh, indicators, jurisdictional performance, that brings with it a risk, of course, that poor performing areas will be blacklisted and embargoed at exactly the places that need investment by good actors who are wishing to step up and make a change uh, will not happen. Um, if certain companies that are at the forefront establish their own system to protect and firewall their own supply chain uh, at, the, at, at the expense of others also being able to do the same in time, that itself will also bring risks of potentially bifurcating the system and having a twin track uh, solution to the problem that, again, will not dr drive the changes that we need on the ground. So we're going to cover that, uh, that canvas of issues, and we're going to do so um, in a number of different ways. Um, the first of which uh, is to in involve uh, you all in getting your perspective as to how much optimism um, and pessimism there is in the room. And to do that, we're using a tool called Slido. Now, I don't know how many of you have got your phones open um, or a computer open, but if you have, then go to slido.com uh, or sli.do, either one, or just Google Slido, and then type in, you'll get to this screen, and then just type in zero deforestation into the hashtag. Zero deforestation. And then click on join. You can do this on your phone or you can do it on your computer. Can I have a minimum show of hands of who's managed to get this far? <laughs> yep, yep, okay, great. So there's the first question. Just to get a little flavor in the room, um, do you think that companies will be able to deliver on their zero deforestation commitments? So obviously there's lots of riders and caveats to that, but just to get a sense of what your gut feeling is, yes or no. So if you vote, then you'll start to see, uh, so I'm going to be positive about this, and I'm going to vote yes, and I'm going to click on send, and then you can see the responses coming in. So 
and you can see that it's live. And if you want to influence the outcome, then you could uh, look at the screen while you vote. <laughs> so there's quite a lot of pessimism. Interestingly, we did this exercise last week at the launch event for our platform trace that Sarah's going to prevent momentarily, and it was exactly this answer, which is... <laughs> this result is just cash, do you mean? Um, all right, so let's, how, many, how, many, how many votes is that? That'll do. That gives us a sense. Oh, it's dropped back down. More, more optimism in the room later. <laughs> oh, some people can't get on my phone, but that's enough. About the same. It was more pessimistic earlier. People thought maybe that's not the mood we should have for this event, so they upped their optimism. Um, so if we go back to another question, let's see if it's the same. Roy, can we change questions? Why does uh, Okay, now it's the Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi is slow. Maybe it would just crash it. The second question. Let's just see if this works. Do you think that governments are going to be able to deliver on their zero deforestation commitments? Same, same answer. Yes or no. Let's just get a quick poll in just to see whether it's the same. Don't let your previous answer influence your first. Right. Well, I'm going to maintain uh, positive optimism. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that, that's, that's interesting in, in, in and of itself. Um, a lot less uh, optimism around, around how governments are going to perform. I mean, that's something that maybe the panel can, can, can think about in their, in their reflections. So without further ado, what we're going to do is we're going to have um, contributions by, by our, our panel, and we're going to have a presentation of a new transparency platform that GCP and SCI launched last week called TRACE. Uh, transparency for Sustainable Economies that Sarah will give a, give a run through. But we're going to kick off with a presentation from Charlotte Schreck, <coughs> who's the founder and director of Climate Focus and was leading the work on the um, um, New York Declaration of Forests assessment, the Assessment Coalition on Gold 2, on the performance of um, uh, companies uh, in delivering on their supply chain commitments under the New York Declaration. And that will set the scene. Uh, following which um, we'll have a presentation from Sarah on the platform, following by which we'll then have reflections from Rod and from Francis, uh, and then turn, turn to you all. And now, whilst we're doing that, you can use um, Slido, if the internet continues to, to perform, you can use Slido to type in a question, something that sparks your interest that somebody said, or that you thought of, and we can add that, and you can vote them. So if you type in something here, um, So if I type in a question, then you can click send, and you can, uh, it's pending, so, so Roy here won't allow stupid questions like this to be, to be approved, <laughs> but he, he, he's, he's, he's approved that one, um, and then you, you, can, you can vote it up if you think it's a good question, and that will be just a nice way for us to capture some of the, some of the ideas in the room. So without further ado. Yes, please come and please come and sit at the front if you're standing at the back because we've got lots of room here. They don't want to. They want to wait and see if it's not interesting enough, and then they might leave. <laughs> That's your challenge. Uh, so I'm going to um, remind our panelists that we have ten minutes each, um, and Steve Steve here will be helping in the enforcement. You. And he'll wave when you've got three minutes left, and he'll wave again when you've got one minute left. And I won't say what he'll do when you've got no minutes. Charlotte, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I'm very glad when you came to the point that Roy is controlling the questions. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering, you know, you said that. Do you like? Do you like her skirt? <laughs> yes. No, but you know, there. Do you like her funny English accent? <laughs> so, <laughs> that, you know. <laughs> so that because there are all kinds of. Things that one can make. So, thank you. Thank you to the Stockholm Environment Institute. Thank you to Global Canopy Program, Toby, Sarah, and the whole team for inviting me to speak. Um, I will present more maybe the problem than the solution. So, the, um, the event is nicely structured in a way that it goes 
more and more from the first speaker towards the solution, towards the end. So we leave you on a positive, optimistic <laughs> note. Um, it's not what we agreed. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. We're actually starting on some, ending on some pretty negative. Oh yeah, so, <laughs> like, okay, so maybe we have a peak in optimism. <laughs> um, so what I do, um, I'm, I'm uh, coordinating a coalition, which is the New York Declaration Assessment Coalition, and we publish an annual report on progress towards meeting the goals of the New York Declaration. The New York Declaration was adopted in 2014 by 190 governments, subnational and national, private sector companies, NGOs, and indigenous people. And it formulates 10 goals, which reach the overarching goal is to eliminate de tropical deforestation by 2030, so the loss of all natural forests by that date. But then it has 10 <coughs> goals that reach from restoration goals, which so in, includes the goals and, and, and formulates even more ambitious goals, the ambitious goals that the bond challenge and speaks to finance, governance, and also to the drivers of deforestation. Um, and agriculture, <coughs> industrial agriculture, um, basic needs of property, fuel, wood, subsistence agriculture, um, but also other economic sectors. So it is a very comprehensive instrument, and it was launched with a lot of uh, publicity, and one of the flaws of the New York Declaration was that it came without any institutional um, institutional backing, institutional follow-up. So what, and then there is a risk of these, uh, these declarations and pledges that once the spotlight is turned off and people went, the CEOs and the governments went home, then then it goes into a drawer and it is being forget, forgotten and nothing happens. And in order to see that not happening, so to avoid this, um, a, a coalition of, of um, think tanks and research organizations <coughs> came together, which includes WW, um, WWF, SEI, CP, CDP, um, Woodsall Institute, Forest Trends. So it's, um, it's a very, you know, a very credible, high-powered group that works now together and publishing the annual reports with the goal to holding the endorsers of the New York Declaration uh, accountable, not only the endorsers of the New York Declaration, particularly the endorsers, but also the whole world, really. And so we have published this year the second annual uh, update on goal 1 to 10, and we have published a deep dive focus report on goal number 2. And goal number two is the one that I will speak now about for the next five minutes, which is the private sector goal. So it is the goal that says that all endorsers to the New York Declaration should support private sector efforts to eliminate deforestation from major agricultural supply chains by 2020. 2020. And these major agricultural supply chains are palm oil, beef, and wood products. <coughs> These are also the, the big four drivers of deforestation. So what we did now with our partners is we, and this is, this is again, the partners. Um, what we did with our partners, we, form, we convened and formulated an assessment framework. And that assessment framework goes from looking through the whole let's say, the whole trajectory of implementing supply chain commitments from the actual pledge, so from the commitment, to eventually the impact on the ground. And these are our criteria that go through it and that look at, okay, we need commitment, we need implementation, we need an enabling environment, that's where we look at the actors that are not the private sector, but governments, finance institutions, NGOs, how supported they are, because we quickly came to the conclusion the private sector alone cannot implement the, and successfully implement the supply chain commitment. It is a multi-sector um, cooperation that is needed. And then we concluded is looking, okay, the impact, what is all that activity translating to, and what is the impact on 
the ground. We have formulated indicators for all for for our three four criteria, and to the extent possible, we relied on existing data. So we took the data of the various transparency initiatives, the four transparency initiatives, compiled them, compared them, analyzed them, and brought them together in uh, to to give us conclusions on the indicators where data is. As we will see, not all the indicators have data. We have complemented what we had in quantita quantitative data with qualitative interviews. So we did reach out to all the private sector endorsers of the New York Declaration, as well as the private sector members of the uh, Tropical Forest Alliance, and, and conducted roughly 30 interviews with people that then, more in a more descriptive, Qu uh, qualitative fashion explain to us how they see their success on meeting supply chain commitments. Now, what is what is the um, the, the result? And we have it's important we have I put some of the reports outside. They may be gone, but uh, it's all on the on the website uh, www.forestdeclaration.org. Both the the overall update report as well as the goal two report. Also, the one on the website doesn't have the typos that the print version has. So the one on the website is actually the one, this went into print just so that we could take it to Marrakesh. We had uh, five days more to correct mistakes on the online version. So that's the, the, the one that is the, uh, the authoritative one. So what are the, uh, what is the, uh, the main conclusions? We see commitments and we see the commitments, the pledges growing. About roughly 100 alone in the last year, from 300 and, uh, 307 to 415 in, this, in, in the last year. So there is a movement, and there is the um, at least the uh, willingness to commit from the side of the private sector. As we then go through the different criteria, and as we go to, um, to the actual impact on the ground, activity decreases. I'm not saying that the private sector entities don't want, but it becomes more difficult to actually reduce deforestation and work on the level of the supplier, the plantation, and the farm. And most importantly also the data decreases. So we have a lot of pledges and we have less on compliance, we have little on monitoring, and we have almost nothing on impact. So here we see that the commitments are increasing. Most companies have done risk assessment and have adopted some sort of policy. That policy can be just saying we, we, uh, we source uh, certified palm oil by 2020. So it can be a very simple one. It can be a lot more involved. And there we see very few companies have actually time-bound action plans that, that formulate strategies on how to implement their commitments on the ground. We have um, monitoring. Very few companies have spatially explicit data on where, from where they're sourced and what is, go, what is going on. So that's where um, companies say yes, there is technology is developing, um, but it's hard for us, many of the, the further the uh, retailers, it's, it's hard for us to work with our suppliers. There is no information. They don't have the information. So that's something where certainly technology and data can help. Um, we know that there is comparatively also little progress in the improvement of the enabling environment. So there is talk of governments to reduce deforestation. There's very little what, what companies feel, see, can smell and touch in terms of improvements on the ground. And we have nothing which tells us whether all that activity, everything, is actually reducing deforestation. There is, and that's where trace and the work of Global Forest Watch is so important that maybe in the next year we work towards something where we do have more data because at the moment we don't even know whether it goes into the right direction. And that, assuming that all the actors are trying and willing and intending, we still don't have a way to monitor it. So that, um, with that, I describe the problem. You can download the report, read it, and then get excited about next year's report. Thank you very much, Chelsea.
I mean, that sets the scene really superbly, and it also sets the challenge um, very directly. Um, you couldn't have been more to the point in saying that there really is nothing uh, out there at the moment that can give us confidence as to how much progress is being made, despite the optimism that there was that there was earlier in the room. Just one, uh, I'm watching Slido here, and just, just to keep the, uh, keep the audience engaged, um, I was intrigued by one question that an anonymous person posted. Your website shows no private sector partners. Do you think this is a problem? Uh, Do you no. think yes or no? No. <laughs> so if you think that no is an inappropriate response, whoever asked that question, then bear that in mind. Um, for later. And we also don't have government partners and we don't have any, so this is a purely civil so the research organization think tank with civil society. We wouldn't accept government partners and we wouldn't accept private sector partners. So that's our independence in this. <laughs> okay, so moving um, smoothly across to my friend and colleague Sarah Lake from the Global Canopy Program, um, who is going to introduce um, the platform that we launched last Friday, Transparency for Sustainable Economies, Trace. So. Thank you, Toby. Thanks a lot for the excellent setup. Very, very well positioned. Part of what the problem is is that we know companies are making commitments, you know, governments are making commitments, and there's this enormous <coughs> momentum for addressing deforestation from commodity production, but we actually have no indication of if these commitments are leading to impact. We have no connection between what the actors are committing to and what's happening on the ground. So what Trace aims to do is to fill in that gap by better linking actors to the impacts on the ground through mapping of material flows. So I'm going to try and do a live demo. The internet is working great, so it's a huge risk always to do a live demo, but we're going to try and do it, and hopefully it works out. And so to begin with, let's see, there we go. So to begin with, this is where we are now in understanding commodity supply chains. On the left, we have soy coming from Brazil, and on the right, we have all of the importing countries. So we have a general sense when we look at data that exists today that soy from Brazil is going largely to China and a number of other countries that are importing it for soy in the form of soybeans, soy cakes, soy oil, but also soy that's being consumed in Brazil for chickens and then being exported as such. What Trace does is expands this, especially to give granular data on the origin of the soy to better link it to the impacts on the ground. So we move from having this view to this view. We can now see at a municipal level scale where soy is produced and where it moves to in the world, as well as who it transfers through. So Trace provides information on the specific actors in the supply chain through which the soy is passing. This level of granularity at the municipal level is necessary in order to improve decision making. You cannot make improved sourcing decisions if you don't know the specific areas you're working in as well as the impact in those areas. So we move to the Trace platform. At launch, we're focusing specifically on soy from Brazil as an initial proof of concept of the way in which we can demonstrate the use of this material mapping in a number of different decision support uh, capabilities. But we can quickly expand to cover other commodity and geography linkages. So while we start with soy, we can quickly cover other materials as well. And we'll be expanding to cover all the soy from Latin America, then moving to cattle in Brazil and cattle from other Latin American countries, and then moving to palm oil, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, as well as other uh, deforestation risk commodities across different geographies as well. If we go into the tool, Scroll on your computer, Toby. There we go. If we go into the tool, if it loads, we can see a detailed analysis of the material flows across actors and places. the material flows of over 70 million tons of soy exported from Brazil in 2015, moving from the municipalities of production through the exporters to the importers and ultimately to the importing country. So we can see really quickly 
the major traders that are involved, the municipalities where it's originating, as well as the fact that it's going largely to China, as well as a number of other countries. From this somewhat simplified view, we can also pull out individual strings. We can look and say specifically, what soy is going to soy? What soy is going to Spain, and who is it traveling through? But we can also look at the other view and say, what soy is coming from a particular place and going to Spain? And narrow this particular view down to an even finer and finer string. The data underlying this is over 300,000 unique material flows, and this will probably take a second to load because it's so much data. But this is 300,000 over 300,000 unique material flows that map all of the soy. We have 100% coverage of soy exported from Brazil. So this gives us both granularity in terms of understanding where in Brazil the soy is coming from, but also scale. We have wall-to-wall -wall coverage of the exports from Brazil to give us a complete picture of what's happening in the soy sector. From here, we can dig deeper. We know that within here, there's some key actors like Cargill or Bungie who are major traders. If we want to dig further into their supply chain, we can select Bungie here and zoom specifically to their supply chain. So here's just Bungie. We look at Bungie's supply chain and we can see that they're sourcing that Primavera here is the municipality that is providing uh, single-handedly the largest amount of soy from a single municipality. And then a lot of their soy is ending up in China. What we can also do is then look at some of the sourcing area patterns and be able to see, for example, what biome is Bungie sourcing from? So this recolors according to the biome in which they're sourcing from. And here, this pink block at the top represents the Sahado. So we can see, in fact, that Bungie is sourcing a fair percentage of their soy from the Sahado. We can go even further to look specifically at what this link to deforestation is. So here are options for recoloring, but we can resize. So right now, the thickness of the flow is colored according, or is scaled according to the volume. But we can rescale it according to the amount of deforestation, and specifically the amount of deforestation from soy. Using data from our partners at Agro Satellite in Brazil, we can see this is the deforestation specific from soy conversion in the Sahado. And then we can see these municipalities at the top. You can see them light up on the map as well in terms of where they're located in Brazil. And we can see that these municipalities all fall within the Sahado, but specifically within one region of Mato Pico. If we want to explore this more, we can go to the geographic information within the map. And here we have a number of different geospatial layers that allow us to get a better sense of what the impacts on the ground are. So for example, we can look at the deforestation of soy. So here's the deforestation rate. And then we can look at soy production. And if you look at this overlay here, the darkest areas are where you have the most deforestation as well as the most soy production. And what we can see is if we look at these municipalities in Bungie's supply chain, these all fall, fall in some of the darkest areas. So it gives you a really clear sense of the way in which this particular trader is linked to specific municipalities as well as the impact in those areas. We can also explore other types of indicators. We have indicators on water, on development, <coughs> and on social indicators. So a spectrum of different types of indicators, not just looking at forests, but the impacts that forests have on local communities and local landscapes. If we go back to this particular municipality, you can choose any of these municipalities and dig deeper into what's happening in this particular place. So let's look at this particular municipality. We dig in here and we get a quick fact sheet showing specifically what's happening in this one municipality. We can see it's located in a particular state, it's in the Sahado, and how much of land there is occupied by agriculture. But also, what is the high-level overview of the specific environmental and social indicators in that place, as well as who else is operating there. So we know that Bungie is sourcing from here, but we can also see that Cargill is one of the major players sourcing. That Cargill is sourcing 18%, uh, accounts for 18% of the soy exported from this, this municipality. We can then also say, well, if Cargill is sourcing from here, where else are they sourcing from? And switch between the perspective of places to this perspective of actors and be able to go between them, iterating from place to actor to understand the linkages between them in the supply chain. So here we can see some high-level statistics on Cargill in terms of where they're sourcing from, where they're shipping to, and then some of the sustainability indicators in those municipalities. But what we really want to be able to do to answer this question of are actors implementing their commitments, are we seeing improvement on the ground, is be able to compare across companies. So if we go back to the tool,
one of the key features of this is the ability to look at the overlay between commitments and deforestation. So we can say here, if we recolor by do they have a soy deforestation commitment. The color's a little odd, but the bright yellow up here is yes, they do, so we know that Bungie, Cargill, and ADM have commitments, whereas other traders do not. But then we can also overlay this with the amount of deforestation. So to get a sense of is there, in fact, a correlation between the amount of deforestation in a company's supply chain or in a, in a municipality's supply chain with the commitments that they have in place. So we've done analysis offline of this as well. So we've taken the data that powers trace and we've taken it offline to show specifically the way in which this, this looks like. If you take the municipalities with soy production and look at the coverage within that municipality by a zero deforestation commitment. And you can see, so the red shows no coverage, whereas the green shows greater coverage. So to start giving you a sense of, are we seeing improvements in the geographies that have higher coverage by zero deforestation commitments? And you can see in some areas there's huge gaps where there's no coverage. And if you look in the Sahado that's outlined in the red dot, you can see there's, there's some coverage, but there's still you know, quite a lot of deforestation happening there. To give you a sense of how this data can be extracted from Trace, and give you useful insights in terms of being able to support improved decision making. So real quick, the last piece here is just to highlight, if we go back to the home page, that this data is all open and free. It's not downloadable at the moment simply because we just launched on Friday, but it will soon be downloadable and accessible to everyone. With the idea that this isn't simply a platform that's meant to be a platform is pretty and up there, but really about getting the data in the hands of people who are making decisions and who can use this to support support their efforts, whether it's NGOs or researchers or financiers who are assessing risk in their portfolio. So we have a number of different examples here of how we've used this data offline to conduct example analyses, as well as some ideas for how you can start exploring the tool. So if you click on any of these, we can look at deforestation hotspots. Oops. I'll take you through the tool with some ideas for how to get started, and particularly looking at some examples. And we're curious to hear from you what types of user stories or what types of specific experiences are useful for you to understand the tools. What stories do you want to be able to tell with this? So with that, I'd uh, also like to thank the partners that have made this possible. The website is developed in partnership with Visuality and the European Forest Institute, as well as a series of funders who have generously made Trace possible. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, and Craig, our friend from Visuality, is sitting here with us as well. And our colleagues from many other partners are not here. But just to say that this is clearly uh, an enormous um, uh, ambition, um, and we're only at the tip of the iceberg. And this can only be accomplished through more partnerships with many other actors, many of whom are in this room. Um, and we very much look forward to that. And there's a nice set of questions pinging in um, that we won't go through the answers of now, but Sarah answered some of them. But today, so yes, will be. Um, available, it would somewhat contradict the name um, if we didn't make the data available. Um, but with that, we're now going to move to our um, our next uh, panelist, um, Rob Taylor, who's the uh, just recently arrived director of the um, forest program at uh, WRI, uh, and is now overseeing the the GFW platform. Um, Rob was formerly um, head of forest and WWF International, so comes with an extraordinary experience of looking at this issue from many different perspectives including what some of these commitments actually mean uh, and the way in which they're interpreted. Um, and we've asked Rod to speak particularly uh, about the way in which we can start to move towards a system that can track and understand both the performance of companies and the performance uh, of the places and, 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 and the territories uh, and the jurisdictions uh, that produce the products that the companies are trading and also the way in which tracking the interdependency of those relationships, because until we can do that, we're not going to get a handle uh, on some of the drivers that are, that are reshaping um, these supply chains for better or worse. Rod, thank you very much for joining us. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you. I haven't got a PowerPoint, so I don't know what I should say. Just to... um, thanks, Toby. And I think it's uh, really, really exciting to see uh, Trace there. And um, I've been working on this issue for a long time. and the. Uh, the trade part has always been the biggest black box, and to see that opening up is really fantastic. But the other, the other side of it, I think, is um, 
we're creating a, a virtual circle of transparency because as this data goes up, it's not going to be perfect. And if a trader or a company is, is shown in the wrong way, that it creates an incentive for them to put their own better data into the system and correct the story. So you get this virtual circle of uh, transparency, which is really uh, powerful. And then um, with WRI and, and others, we're, we're also working on the more um, place-based aspects of this. So you can start to really get more and more data layers, pixel by pixel, in a place. So we're seeing much more transparency in terms of who owns farms, who owns oil palm concessions. Um, what is the land use change happening in and around those more and more um, granular detail, more and more regular updates. Um, we could have alerts now where deforestation is happening almost in near real time. And whoever it is, whether it's a regulatory authority or an NGO, can investigate why that deforestation is happening and starting to connect it up to the kind of uh, information in trace. So you have a, a whole new uh, ball game in terms of uh, transparency and there's less and less place for uh, companies to hide who are doing the wrong thing. But um, Toby posed a very simple question to me, is how do you monitor all this? And, and the answer is, it's a very complicated question and the answer isn't simple. And I think it really boils down to there's um, layers and layers of system boundaries in all, all this. So if you take the um, kind of the narrowest system in all this, it's the, it's the system around a very particular supply chain. And so you can now look at where this producer is. Um, when that, you can watch a, a commodity move through a particular supply chain and end up with a very specific um, uh, end user, whether it's a retailer or a big brand. And that might be really interesting because that particular flow might be completely deforestation free. But then if you broaden the system a little bit more broadly and say, well, hang on a minute, well, who is that producer? And um, maybe they're sending you a deforestation-free commodity, and maybe they've got an another farm or another plantation somewhere else where they're sending somebody else a commodity that's very much linked to deforestation. So going beyond one supply chain into several supply chains, you might find that an actor has kind of a, a, a dual strategy, good stuff to the market, bad stuff to another market. And then you could take it a step further in terms of um, corporate groups. So if, if you, I, I don't know, in the round table and sustainable palm world, there's kind of an expectation that if you're a producer, all your uh, projects has to be certified. But there's been enormous challenges in to get a whole corporate group to move on these issues consistently. And so do you, do you target a corporate group? Or is it okay for a corporate group to have some parts of its operations that are deforestation free and other parts that are still troubled? Um, then you have the whole issue of deforestation free being, a, if you like, a single cause issue. So we're only going to worry about deforestation free and stop at that point. So if a company can demonstrate that it's not linked to deforestation, is that the end of the sustainability story for them? Or are we going to explore more, find out about the labour conditions on their plantations? Are we going to ask other questions that go to broader issues of sustainability? Are they polluting the local river and so on and so on? So again, the system boundary issue, if we just worry about deforestation, there could be many sustainability issues that get missed. And this is where um, things like certification are an interesting complement to the deforestation free issue, because they do look at uh, generally a wider suite of issues. Then we have the, um, the the whole supply chain thing. So the emphasis on this work in, in, in large part is on what happens at the start of the supply chain. What happens on the farm or in the plantation or in the forest. There are many problems in supply chains that can occur further down the supply chain. We could have, if we're looking at uh, climate change impacts, there can be impacts associated with processing or transport that far um, outweigh the impacts in the field. We can also have uh, labour issues further down the supply chain in factories and so on. So again, is the system just what happens to the farm gate? Or are we looking at the whole supply chain and how do we get transparency further down the chain? Then we have other sectors. So at the moment, the, the focus is on soy in, in trace and palm oil and beef and, and timber are all on the agenda for the New York deprivation. But recently, for example, there's been a spate of deforestation in the Mekong linked to rubber. So, you know, we can get leakage from one sector to another. If we solve the problem in palm oil, 
and then another sector could move in uh, to become the driver of deforestation in an area. We have time, but timing is a really tricky systems issue here. Because if, if we create a system where the day a company stops deforesting, it's kind of in the good books, we can create an incentive for a company to do as much deforesting as it can for as long, as long as it needs to, to establish its production base. And then it can stop and put their hands up and say, hey, I'm not deforesting anymore. So we need to think about how far back in time we, we go. You know, is the um, pulp growing on a forest that was uh, converted five years ago deforestation free or not? Is it deforestation free if that conversion had occurred 10 years ago? So these kind of questions, the, the timing is very important. And if you know, a lot of people say we should forget about the past, but if we do that, we create an enormous incentive to uh, delay getting on board with these commitments for as long as possible. Um, and linked to that, I think, is the whole question of how companies deal with their legacies. If a company has a deforestation-free le legacy, I've always been an advocate that they shouldn't be off the hook until they do something serious about addressing that legacy. That can be restoration, could be some kind of contribution to conservation to offset the harm, and particularly on the social side. A lot of the historical deforestation is really a major driver for social conflict. And those conflicts are still there. So just because the company's not deforesting anymore doesn't mean the social conflicts from the legacy have gone away. So I think it's really important to look at legacy issues in this whole game. Um, then I think we move into more, the more tricky forms of leakage. You know, the soy moratorium is, is famous for its impacts in Brazil, but we might see leakages into other uh, companies because that moratorium is so strong in one country but there's not the equivalent in another. So that's another system boundary we need to take into account. And then finally, I think there's the whole issue of, um, in many of these places in the deforestation fronts, we really have a problem with poor governance. And if companies can go only so far with voluntary commitments, um, if the basic enabling conditions, as was highlighted before, aren't there. And we, we really need to think, is this, really working to get governments thinking about issues like land tenure and uh, more inclusive approaches to development. And you know, it's this whole thing taking us towards achieving the sustainable development goals at the same time as stopping deforestation. So I think Francis is going to talk a little bit more about the link to governments, but it would be a shame if companies do all they can with their private sector tools, but this doesn't start to drive some of that governance that, that for example, RED is interested in. So we really need to get the interaction clear between the voluntary private sector actions and what happens in the field of governance. Um, that's all I, I had to say. I just think, um, I think just to, to conclude, I think we really have a, a problem here of whack-a-mole. You know the game whack-a-mole? You, you whack one mole, another one pops up over here. So if we start just focusing on one mole as our system boundary, we bang that one and nail it, and we end deforestation in that province that supply chain, that sector, the real danger is another model wax up over here. So the, the approach to monitoring and assessing success here, we really have to think of the whack-a-mole. What are the moles that are going to jump up? And we have to be ready to monitor them as well. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Rob. That was um, really, really incredibly useful provocations on some of the quite profound challenges and perverse incentives and uh, surprise moles that are going to pop up. And I think it is really helpful to think about what are these different, uh, you call them spheres of, of, of ambition or, or something like that, where on the very local, easy to reach level, we've got consignments that we might think of as being deforestation free, where you've got chain of custody linked to a certification scheme, but obviously that's not in and of itself uh, going to change uh, things at scale. And then you may have um, a company that may have some consignments that are, that are clean and some that are not. Um, to what extent do you use the information about the fact that that company is involved in, in uh, dirty consignments, if you like, uh, to understand how it's performing? How much, do you, how much is it fair and effective to use that information to leverage their change at scale? And then taking it one step further, um, how is it linking to actual change on the ground? Because the commitments that are out there by the companies that are capable and committed to delivering in the near term uh, will definitely just lead to a whole load of moles popping up in lots of other places. So we definitely are not there yet. And on that question, before uh, giving the floor to Francis, we had two more 
uh, sliders for you to get a flavour of how much pessimism is there in the, w the room, actually, about how many moles might pop up in, in unexpected uh, places. And I'm going to change to the, um, to the screen here and how many people are still managing to access this. Um, thank you, Roy. So, first question, and this is, a, this is a slightly more sophisticated question. Um, indicators of, uh, will indicators of jurisdictional performance, for example, deforestation, uh, run the risk of driving embargoes of poorly performing jurisdictions. So this is a profound concern of, of many jurisdictions around the world, that if they are the, exact, the very places that need investment by committed and more sustainable actors in order to turn the system around, then the worst outcome could be that everybody flees from them and they become a vacuum into which is sucked uh, all of the bad guys, um, if you like. So to get a, to get, to get a sense of that, um, I'm going to mildly agree. Pretty similar. But a little bit more uncertainty, perhaps, around that one than the risk of embargoes coming from, from uh, jurisdictional indicators that may flag some areas as potentially being blacklisted. Well, that gives a flavor just to get an idea of where people are in the room, because there's a quite a diverse range of actors and backgrounds, I'm sure. And with that, um, I'm very pleased to turn the floor to Francis Seymour, who I'm sure uh, many, if not all of you know. Um, Francis is formerly, as many of you will know, the director of C4, and currently the, at the Global Development, Centre for Global Development. Francis, what, where, where are you now? Centre for Global Development. Um, and is involved in a whole plethora of projects that are of profound relevance to this, including advising the Packard Foundation and what they're doing around um, oil palm in Indonesia and being involved on a number of different fronts. And there's few people that can speak better, I think, to the relationship between what companies are doing and what governments are doing and what both need to do together, supported by many other actors um, than Francis. So, Francis, the floor is yours. All right, thanks so much, Toby. Um, so let me start out by just uh, giving warm congratulations to SEI and GCP and the other partners present who are uh, involved in producing this amazing, uh, cool tool. And I'm trying very hard to be gracious, but I'm telling you, it's, it's difficult. Let me tell you why. Um, many of you know that one of the things I've been up to for the last couple of years is trying to write a book on, you know, why forests, why now, to sort of make the case to those who haven't gotten the memo yet that forests are important to the climate agenda and the development agenda. Rob, this is your cue to pull the yeah. Coming soon. Uh, thank you, Rob. You can sit down. Um, and chapter eight in this book um, is about the global commodity supply chains as a driver of deforestation. And it, there's a footnote that mentions trace, by the way. We got it in. Yeah. Um, but when we first started working on this, we commissioned a paper for Martin Person and, and his colleagues. And based on his analysis of embodied emissions from deforestation of four major commodities in seven countries, we came up with this, what we thought was really cool infographic, you know, that shows the thickness of the arrows going from producer countries to particular regions, and you can kind of see. Well, you know, now this is like four steps ahead because the incredible granularity down, you know, below to the level of municipalities, um, the greater specificity in the destination jurisdictions, the identification of supply chain actors in the meantime, and bringing the data up to date to 2015. So thanks a lot for rendering our book obsolete before it's even published. <laughs> okay. But anyway, seriously, folks, um, you know, this tool obviously is a critical one to help in the enterprise of implementing the, the uh, commitments on the part of the companies, as well as empowering the watchdogs um, and, and, and holding companies accountable for implementing their commitments. And I think, as Charlotte's presentation made clear, we're still a long way from, from doing either of those, and, and this trace monitoring tool is going to be, be a big help. But I think, um, as was indicated in some of the voting results, um, we need to be honest with ourselves that even if it were successful that these commitments by the companies were implemented, we don't have a very clear theory of change about how that would actually result in achieving the ultimate objectives, one of which, maybe not the only one, is reducing deforestation overall. And so as several speakers have, have already alluded to, 
um, it is quite possible that individual companies could implement their uh, supply chain commitments, but that there would be leakage within and between jurisdictions, and that, and we've even seen some examples of this, that even areas that are set aside by some companies in implementing their commitments are vulnerable to being reallocated to those who don't have such qualms or encroach on um, by other producers. And I think it's fair to say that in the, the reasonable time frame, there will always be insensitive markets who are willing to buy um, those products. And um, many of those markets, and certainly in the place I know best, like Indonesia, you know, it's a domestic market that, that provides that. And so we're not even having to talk about exports. So for all of those, those reasons, um, it's, it's a concern about whether the supply chain commitments implementation on their own um, meet the effectiveness test. But beyond that, um, there was a Seaport publication several years ago on Red where Errol Appleson, you know, took um, a colleagues, the, the so-called 3E uh, framework, you know, is it effective, is it efficient, is it equitable? And I think if we apply that framework to the, the commodity supply chain commitments, um, we come up with problems on all three because, as we've already discussed, there's a question about effectiveness. There's also a question about efficiency. Does it really make sense for every company in the commodity supply chains to invest in the traceability all the way down, you know, to the farm level? And you know, is it realistic to think about, you know, certifying, for example, every individual of the millions of smallholders, you know, that would need to to um, be addressed in, in that kind of compliance regime? And then there's the equity questions, where, um, again, we've already seen some evidence that some companies, in, in, in order to try to reduce risk, will just cut out uh, smallholders from their supply chains, because that's harder to, to control. Um, and then there are these sort of temporal equity issues that Rod alluded to about that a lot of these systems really just reward the people who got there first. You know, and so if you deforested earlier, you're okay, but if you're a late number, I'm sorry, Charlie. So um, there are a lot of issues uh, in this, this, this whole approach. So um, I think that for many of us, um, that has led us to thinking about the potential power of the so-called jurisdictional <coughs> approach. And you know, what are the ways to incentivize governments, and particularly at subnational jurisdictions, which are often the level of land use planning or permitting. Um, to uh, really how, think about how to leverage improved performance at the scale of an entire um, political unit. Now, um, it takes a lot of nerve for somebody at an event that has as its hashtag Think Landscapes to make this comment, but I feel like I have to. Um, I'm, I'm a little, I want to be very clear that when I talk about jurisdictions, I'm talking about political administrative jurisdictions that have elected political leadership with the authority to do things like enforce the law. That is different from landscapes or supply sheds or ecosystems like watersheds that don't have that characteristic. And so when I'm talking about jurisdictions, I'm talking about political jurisdictions. Okay. Um, and uh, I think that, that addressing these problems at the landscape scale has lots of benefits in that 3E framework. Because, you know, effectiveness, you actually are covering wall to wall. And it has the potential to deal with some of these um, cross-commodity uh, linkage issues. Um, it's also presumably more efficient. I mean, if you can imagine a world in which you could sort of certify an entire jurisdiction as producing, you know, deforestation-free or other, other, you know, products, that, that makes it a lot more efficient for the, the producers in the supply chain. I also think it has the potential to be more equitable because it creates a political platform for, for example, indigenous peoples to make their claims to, you know, rights to land and seek redress um, for past legacy issues, again, that, that Rod mentioned, and also potentially for governments to you know, deal with companies about how they might uh, productively deal with their legacy issues that may require actions outside the boundaries of their particular um, concessions. So anyway, for all those reasons, many people um, have come to the conclusion we need to focus on the jurisdictional scale. And my own limited involvement in this is through my work advising the Patrick Foundation, which has a strategy focused on trying to control um, palm oil driven deforestation and peatland conversion in Indonesia and that's really the, the basis of, of any expertise I, I might claim to have. And so um, the Packer Foundation is supporting a number of grantees which include, for example, the Earth Innovation Institute's work in uh, Central Kalimantan and TNC's uh, approach in East Kalimantan to try to, to engage at this, this jurisdictional scale. So. Um, 
what's the theory of change from the jurisdictional uh, approach? It is that, it is, because many of you in your voting, you said, well, you actually have less confidence in governments meeting their commitments than you do in, in, in governments, right? So why do we think that there's any, any potential here? And I think that, um, very simplified, there's a theory that a bundle of incentives can be presented to elected political leaders at the subnational level that would be sufficient to tip them from business as usual deforestation to um, doing something different and implementing the kind of improved uh, land use planning, law enforcement uh, that would need to, to take place to provide, provide an enabling environment. Um, it also has the benefit of aligning with the jurisdictional scale of red finance, which has been agreed uh, in the context of the UNFCCC. Um, and potentially could, could align with, with private sector uh, finance screens as well. Um, as part of that, a part of the value proposition would be that jurisdictions that move in this direction have preferential access to markets. And so we heard in Paris, for example, companies like Unilever making as their big flagship announcements in Paris a commitment to uh, preferential jurisdictional sourcing from jurisdictions that are making progress towards uh, sustainable development and including reducing emissions from, from deforestation and forest degradation. And so part of the theory of change is that that signal from the global market will get the attention of subnational political leaders um, and think, well, they need to move in this direction. And furthermore, that producers within the jurisdictions who are affected by these changes in global market preferences will become a political constituency within the district um, for reform. So um, the idea is that you know, maybe those things could come together and, and, and make a real difference. But I think in the same way we have to be clear-eyed about the assumptions that underlie the, the supply chain uh, commitment theory of change. There are a lot of shaky assumptions under this jurisdictional approach theory of change as well. Um, the first is that there is um, a sufficient uh, uh, incentive embodied in that market access to um, prompt a change of behavior by the producers or the governments. And I think the slide that was shown earlier about the different colors of the relationship between uh, soy production and, and deforestation shows that different municipalities may be very differentially positioned. And I think there will be differences across places as well as differences across commodities. The second assumption is that companies are going to be willing to stick their necks out and be advocates for change. And at an event uh, at the, the main venue yesterday, I asked the question, can somebody give me an example of a company sticking its neck out? In a, and nobody could give me one. And the one that we all know about, the IPOP experience in Indonesia, where the companies sort of took a public commitment to engage on the policy agenda, they were disbanded within two years. Um, so uh, I guess the, to, I'm, I'm running out of time, but I guess to make a long story short, on both the, the commodity supply chain commitment implementation as well as the jurisdictional approach implementation, we face a similar risk of the bifurcated supply chains, either you know, uh, having the bad guys continue to sell to insensitive markets or having the good guys disengage from bad jurisdictions and, and leaving it to the bad guys. So what do we do about that? Um, I think that, that we're, we're stuck with a, a complex world where it's a both-and solution, and we in civil society need to certainly continue to um, hold the companies accountable for implementing their commitments, but at the same time find ways to incentivize them to stay engaged in jurisdictions that may not have made sufficient, may not you know, have achieved the nirvana of zero deforestation yet, but there's a plausible case that they are on the path to being there and can provide, uh, those companies can provide an incentive for further progress. My own discussions with private sector people in Indonesia is that you know, they really do need political cover and that in order to not just focus in on cleaning up their own supply chains and buying from smallholders that deforested 20 years ago, and instead move to the adjacent district where there's still active deforestation going on around the national park, they need political cover. And political cover can be provided by these sort of multi-stakeholder processes that have buy-in from civil society and governments. But it, it uh, requires a nuanced approach that I think um, those of us in civil society haven't always been successful in, in, uh, in coordinating. So the bottom line, uh, the jurisdictional approach, like Red Plus, largely remains a great idea that hasn't been tried yet. And uh, the trace tool, I think, provides a, a really powerful um, it, a tool that will help us implement both of those. So thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Francis, and it really is.
quite a privilege to have had such a stellar panel, and it's great that we have this film because it's quite hard to absorb all the nuggets of experience that, that, that our three guests um, have contributed to this debate as we listen to them. But we've got 20 minutes left, and we'd really like to make sure that there's, um, the vast experience and insights of the room is made the most of. And not everyone has a phone or a computer, so we're not going to be tyrannical about those people that managed to post a question on this Slido tool. But just to get a flavor, because here's, here's some of them. Um, and some of them are quite specific about trace, which will probably jump over the, 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 the practical questions around trace, because we'll be very happy to discuss those afterwards. And they're of less general interest to the, to the wider group. And quite a few have come up. So please uh, get your hands ready. But just to kick off, Charlotte, one, one, one for yourself, this first one, which was the top, the top ranked uh, question. Um, do you, I mean, it, it resonates with, with a lot of the kind of skepticism that we've heard in the room as to the, what is this gap between uh, who's making the commitments in a company and those that are actually having to implement them and to what extent in your experience in, in, in taking this work forwards and assessing progress to date and the lack of data that you've, you've articulated, do you think there is a, a profound lack of practical uh, understanding around the implications? Um. I'm not sure whether they understand the New York Declaration Pledge because technically the private sector signing up to the New York Declaration Pledge has to contribute to all goals. They are not only signing up to goal two. And I have my doubts whether that has sunk in. They do more understand their own pledges, so their own zero deforestation pledges, I think most most companies have thought about them, and consequently, they are relatively weak. Um, there is one of the big problems with the pledges is um, they are they vary. Uh, very often, they are limited to a particular geography or a particular supply chain. They not necessarily have very ambitious time frames. So we may say it's great that they have all these uh, pledges, but the pledges are not all great. Um, so that, that's very important and one of the big findings. And then in, in, the, in, in understanding what they can do to actually implement them, it's, it's, uh, it's, I think it's all over the place. There are some companies that know it pretty well and others are trying to figure it out as they go along. And the easiest for the companies is always just to push the responsibility, as a responsibility to the suppliers by saying, we, by a certain date, or even without a certain date, we, we procure preferentially certified palm oil, for example, without paying a premium. You know, that doesn't really cost a lot to say that, and that's a pledge. So, um, you, you, well, I spend a lot of time thinking, oh, I could go on and on and on, but that's, you know, that's the direction of, so they don't know some, but some, some, some do really good work, so it's also not saying that they're Thanks, thanks, Charlotte. It does seem that part of the solution to that needs to be bringing together different kinds of data sets that different groups are creating to make explicit and transparent what are the shared connections that a given suite of actors have, because this passing the book down the line or, or back up the supply chain or to a, to a jurisdiction or to a company can happen much more easily when the actors are floating in space and no one really knows the extent to which they are particularly connected to another suite of actors. And if we start to get a, a handle on that, then it can drive this, this cycle of, 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 this potentially virtuous cycle of improved transparency and action that, that Rod was talking about. So let's take, um, let's take a couple of questions from the floor. I'm sure you've all got, well, you've got comments as well, critiques, uh, also very welcome. Let's take two or three. Uh, starting at the front end, yes, please. Yeah, I'm actually going to repose the top question, which is my question. Oh. Uh, <laughs> because I think it's really essential. You know, this tool looks amazing. I'm really like amazing work. Well done. Um, sorry, my name is Anselm Ebing from Terra Genesis International. Um, but I would really like to know where this data comes from because I think it's very important to have an idea that this data is independent and uh, doesn't come just from the companies themselves, and so I wonder if you could say a few words about that. Sure. Okay. Let's, uh, let's answer that one, because I think a lot of people have that question. We don't want to get too distracted on the details, but it is pretty fundamental. I'm going to ask Sarah to. Sorry. Um, 
Yeah, so I'm not the best person to answer this question, and who is, is Javier Udar, who is our, our senior scientist at SEI, who couldn't be with us today because his son fell ill. So he will probably despise my answer. But the basic idea is that all of this data is collected from currently existing data sets that are government collected. So we use customs data, tax data, trade data, bills of lading, which are the documents signed at the ports when the materials are exported, and simply combine these. So we're stitching these different documents together. And they're publicly available, but not free. So we are purchasing this data and then aggregating it to make it available on the platform. But we've had conversations with the data providers to give us the ability to do this, to make it public, as long as it's not reconstructable and they're not using their, their ability to resell this data in the original form. But the original form is not what we're showing at all. In fact, we're showing some very different data product that is the combination of these different existing uh, government data sets. So none of this right now is coming from companies. And what we'd like to do, ideally, is to expand this in either direction, to be able to link it with more specific data within the municipalities or better information coming from companies, both on the downstream end but also the upstream end. So to be able to extend the supply chain out as well as to add the richness of the environmental and social impact data over it. Thank you, Sarah. I mean, core, core to, to this is that we are uh, interested and in working to make the most of data that are already available but have been poorly tapped. Um, it's kind of alarming that global trade data has been so poorly used by the sustainability community. One question here, please, and think as well not, and then, and then and the next here, think as well not just on questions for your own experiences and reflections on some of these profound risks of bifurcation of companies fleeing from the areas where they really need to invest that you could share, share with the room. Yes, please. Uh, uh, my name is Donovan Burton from Climate Planning in Australia. Um, I suppose the first question is how many companies are signatories to the NYDF and what percentage you know, of uh, impact on forests do they represent? Um, and then just a, a comment around um, Francis's uh, uh, theory. I, um, I've worked a lot in governance uh, with over 200 cities and it does actually make change. Uh, disclosing the information. Jeez. Thank you. Can we just take another one, please? And if, if, if Charlotte and Francis could, could hold those thoughts in mind, and we just get more. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Daniel Zimmer from Climate Kick, uh, Kick Knowledge and Innovation Community. Um, I had a question regarding the uh, entire supply chain and the downstream part mm -hmm. at the moment. We are focusing as mm -hmm. on trade, for instance. You focus very much on the upstream. What about going downstream also involving consumers and, and because of all the complexity that we have heard, isn't it also a must that uh, the entire supply chain be covered better so that uh, people also buying things have a better understanding and what, what would be your thoughts about, about this? Thank you. Yeah, Charlotte, please. Um, on the so the New York Declaration has 59 private sector partners out of the 190. They are other big companies. How much they, so they are, I have now the same disclaimer as Sarah, I need to ask my data people. <laughs> so, um, so how much they contribute to global deforestation, I need to look up. I, I think we have the data. What we do know is that generally, the companies that have signed up to the New York Declaration and the TFA members are performing better than the rest, also better than the ones that have pledges. Just see that they are more engaged, So, but that's also a biased group. So our interviews were with a biased group because it was already one that is more engaged, which is actually responding to these calls. Um, on the consumer part, we, uh, it's, 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 very important and it has different elements according to the different supply chains. There are supply chains where where we, we can already see government action also from the demand side from the importing jurisdiction matters. So we see an impact of the revised biofuels regulation in the European Union on palm oil, a push towards certification. We see a clear impact on enforcing illegal timber legislation in the US and in Europe. In the US in 2015, there was the first fine uh, issued under the Lacey uh, Act, which was 13 million US dollars, and that's a significant price tag. So that matters, so that is public policy. With soy and palm, it is very difficult for a consumer to make these choices because it's such a blended product. So it's very hard for you to go and look always in the fine print and where the 
So there, we need more labeling, we need more policy, we need to more transparency, which we can't take the decisions. Um, beef and timber is a bit easier because it's for us easier to, the tracing back to, it's, it's easier and you can take a decision. But I just tell you, don't eat beef. <laughs> there is no way that beef is, is sustainable. It's, there is no way to produce sustainable beef. So, um, well, there's better and worse. But <laughs> there are certainly better and worse, but it is, uh, it's, it's problematic. Uh, Thanks, thanks, thanks. <laughs> uh, so I always need to say that. We won't get dragged into, into a discussion about, about everyone going vegetarian. Um, so, Sarah, did you want to add to the question on downstream? On, on this question of downstream, it's a great question. So the data we have now ends at the country of import, but there's obviously room to expand. We can start moving towards including retailers, and then that gets us closer to consumers. The, some of this data might be out there. We start with importing countries for the moment, but there's certainly wealth of data out there that we could get to. But one of the points that I think you're, you're getting at is that it's simply not just the consumers, but it's also the governments that are importing as consumers. So part of our strategy is working closely with consumer governments, especially as part of the Amsterdam Declaration, where we're seeing these national level commitments to sustainable sourcing. Uh, a, a deforestation where we really want to make the most change, but the market incentive is, is still less. So really complex to do. Thanks. Thanks, Francis. And clearly, getting the incentives to be aligned. Andrew, do you want to come back on that specific point? Yes. Briefly, if you will. Yeah. Look, I just want to follow up on that because I think it's so important. I think most of what we've done in GLF and everything on this forestry has been a supply side issue. We've gone on and on about risks associated with supply and been trying to push a stone uphill, persuading people to move to a business case for which there is no mandate at all. So I would love to see us exactly picking up on what Francis said use the energy that we've had over the last decade to look at the demand side of this problem. And there are things you can do using five things. I've put it on five fingers of my hand, if I can remember them all. That's anyway, first of all, tariffs and trade. Uh, tariffs between Europe and supplying countries, very difficult, WTO rules. But the big importers of, say, palm oil, India and China, there is a WTO problem. So you can use tariffs to incentivize sustainable palm oil over unsustainable palm oil. So tariffs, look at that. Secondly, subsidies, we all know that's crazy. A lot of cases, we should be looking at that. Credit from banks also should incentivize people doing the right thing rather than people doing the wrong thing. Uh, we should also look at tax. We should stop taxing goods and start taxing bads. And we should finally use public procurement, the power of public procurement. Those are the five things. Remember them on your hand. Let's have some energy on those issues <laughs> and not just the supply side issues moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Excellent. Question at the back there, please. Um, and we get a mic too. Thanks. Um, hi, my name is Duncan Gromko. I work with Unique Forestry and Land Use. Thanks very much for the presentations. I found them uh, quite interesting. Um, so I want to share my reflections. I, I work on a, a zero deforestation in cotton project in Zambia. And I'm just imagining trace being used there by the multinational companies that we work with, and I really fe I fear that exactly what Rob and Francis were talking about, that um, if multinationals were to pull out of these muni municipalities, that you would very much see um, Chinese and other companies like eager to buy from these same suppliers, and so it would just be a total leakage effect. Um, so I think that transparency is, is absolutely needed and very important, but I wonder what else can we be doing with companies so that to get them to improve the behavior of their supply chain rather than just shifting their supply chain. Thanks. Thank you very much. I mean, that's, that's, that's at the heart of the discussion that we wanted to have here, actually. And of course, there are many ways in which a platform like Trace working with other efforts, not all of them data-driven, but could, could, could address that problem. We need to talk a lot more about opportunities and data that can expose and help shape those opportunities and not just risks, and, and that is part of our theory of change. We need to talk about ways in which um, actors can, can actively take themselves out of the picture. If they are in a place that has a bad name, they can demonstrate through a platform like Trace and others that they're not part of the problem, that they're part of the solution. And we can also demonstrate that if they have a particular level of, of, of demand, that there aren't that many places that they can, that they can go to um, in many parts of the world if they're serious about committing, uh, meeting, meeting these commitments. Um, but I mean, there's no there's no escaping uh, that that risk. How do we make sure that that these things happen more in unison 
um, and that the, the shared understanding doesn't, um, pre doesn't preempt or come in front of the, the incentives that are needed to hold the right actors in the right places. Sir, please. One other thought on that, I think that's an excellent point, and it is a huge risk that we face. I think there's two points. One is the enabling conditions that Andrew just pointed to in terms of making sure there's the right environment that disencourages that type of behavior. So then if the funding is going into the right way and we have the right uh, sort of taxes and, and so forth in place, then it makes it harder to move to a new place. But I think another part of that is actually the research that shows this is happening and what the impacts of that are. So that's something we're starting to explore and trace in terms of preliminary analyses around leakage to show, in fact, that yes, the soy moratoria is effective, but in fact, it's just moving elsewhere. And once we can credibly say that leakage is real and that this type of movement is occurring, then it actually sort of shines the spotlight a little bit more, more harshly on the disinvestment of companies from a particular place. So I think, yes, there's a role for companies, but there's also a role for the number of other actors with working in sustainable supply chains to make sure that that doesn't happen. Excellent point. Thanks, Sarah. And there's so many in this room I'm looking at Crystal and what GFW is doing, but there's so many in the, what can be what can be achieved through the synergies between the likes of GFW Trace and so many other platforms uh, and processes, not all of them about data, is, is enormous and it's beholden upon us in the more research and civil society sectors to ask the right questions at the right time so you can start to, to produce information that helps prevent these risks. We're at time, but is there one last uh, burning question? There's one at the front. Let's take one more. There's a, there's a mic behind you. Thank you. Um, a question would be related to some other elements than just the naming and shaming or uh, actually meeting your supply chain commitments. Because uh, if you look at surveys like a Carbon Disclosure Project, then you look at the risks that companies face and that make them interesting in, in moving into zero de deforestation supply chain is also the risk of uh, ecosystem services that are crucial for their production will no longer be there. So the question would be, um, have, you, have you thought into that direction that this data can be used in order to also inform companies on the delivery of, of, of uh, ecosystem services to their production sites? Because this could also um, actually drive the change further. Thank you. The short answer is yes, absolutely. Um, and there's some materials we have around Trace that are available outside the room, not very many, but uh, better for, for you to go to the website. And some of these questions that people have posed are answered there. And the website is www.trace.earth, um, which is quite edgy, we realize, but it's also <laughs> memorable. Uh, Trace.earth. Um, hmm? Francis is pointing with Rod. Final word. Yeah, just on. Oh, I'm allowed now. Um, just on that question, I think it, it's ecosystem services, yes, but in a lot of these places the returns and the, the economies are so short term that nobody cares. But I think the other interesting angle is long term supply, and that's more of a motivation for the companies. If these basically resources are going to run out, then they've got a real problem. So that's the main uh, interest. Of the business. Thanks, Rob. And on that note, I would like to warmly thank our panel um, and all of you for having come. And please do stay connected. And the whole idea of this one intense day is to make the most of these conversations. So hopefully this can, can inspire uh, more conversations and more activity in this space. And thank you all for coming.